Our precious Lord, we thank you so much for once again we get together with friends and fellowship and learn about your word and the blessings that you're giving us by bringing it, letting us come together. Thank you for calling me to be one of your servants, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for uh, the times that we're having in our country. We just pray that they're going to get better. We're asking a special blessing for um, President Trump that he may be reelected and that he may choose a cabinet that will help him to be even better than he was at the last uh, part of the presidency. Lord, we just thank you for, once again, for helping us to be here. We just pray that you'd be with us and have your spirit here upon this meeting that we can learn and understand about you all the more. Thank you, Lord. We pray that these things in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'd like to address the back. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so we are continuing the uh, study of the theological results of Christ's death on the cross. Last week we talked about the redemption, the redemptive aspect, and uh, the five parts of the, uh, the redemption. And now we're going to look at uh, propitiation. That's a $5 word. (laughs) Propitiation. That's five syllables. So, so yeah, so propitiation. Turn over to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. 1 John 2, 2. And uh, we need to, the next time we buy Bibles, we need to buy big print Bibles. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. We almost need to bring some more. Yeah, I've got. I guess there's only just a few left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm I've got them at home, right in my box. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So okay. First John two two. No, I need to give you all the tabs. The tabs. tabs. My sheet sheet. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, somebody want to read that? 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Oh, um, sure. Now both Jesus and his disciples... Oh, yeah, I think you're in the Gospel of John. Okay. 1 John is the letter toward the end of the Bible, right before Revelation. Uh, go to Revelation and turn back... Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 books... First John two okay. two. Okay. Uh, and he himself is the propiti- propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. That is a five dollar word. Yeah, it is. <laughs> propitiation. <laughs> only, only the King Jimmy. I wonder what the American Standard or NIV has for that word, but anyway. Um, so, uh, the, uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum writes that propitiation, it means that God is satisfied. Now, we look, look at the, his satisfaction. Actually, it's the first theological result of Christ's death was God's satisfaction. And uh, this is a very similar word, propitiation means that God is satisfied with what the death of Messiah accomplished. Uh, in its basic meaning, uh, to propitiate means, quote, to appease the wrath of God. To p- appease or to satisfy the wrath of God. It does not mean His death merely satisfied a venge- vengeful God, but it satisfied a God who is just, righteous, and holy. So, also, the, the, this word is used in 1 John 4.10, and uh, it says, uh, uh, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is the only two places in the New Testament this word is used. 
this fine print has me arching my back like this so I can read it. I guess I did look weird on film. Um, so this is a really powerful because it says, uh, and he is the propitiation for our sins. So we've got sins, and Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. So turn over to uh, turn over to Romans, uh, back to Romans chapter four. Hold your finger there in First John two. Go back to Romans chapter four. Second Corinthians. Romans four. I go to this verse. I think now about every week. I think this is my new pattern for about the last uh, several months. Romans chapter four, verse. Uh, so I read verse uh, 7 and 8. Actually, go back to verse 6. Romans 4, verse 6 through 8. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay. Now the reason that God will not impute or count or reckon our sins against us is because of Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation for our sins. It's not our repenting of sins. It's not our uh, bearing fruit. Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. And when you just let that sink in, I mean, that you know, that's why the Father is completely satisfied. Isaiah chapter 53, He shall see the travail of His soul and shall be satisfied. So we really, we talked about that passage when we were looking at, at the word for satisfaction. Uh, but the same principle applies here. Jesus is the propitiation. For our sins. And therefore we're free. Uh, and, and our sins, which we actually have, and there are sins that, are, that we've committed since we've come to faith in Christ, uh, those sins cannot be counted against us. Because Christ is the propitiation for our sins. We have an offering that is accepted by God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we really, you know, this is really genuinely the battle. And... Um, it is, it is to rest entirely in the work of Christ. And not only, you know, that, that first moment, epiphany moment of salvation, when you believe you receive the gospel by faith and you see Christ in truth as dying on the cross for our sins and being raised from the dead, but now also in a day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, a day-to-day -day basis where we rest, you know, and, and this again is the battle because... Uh, I think what we like to do, I'm speak for myself, is we like, kind of like to hedge our bets a little bit. Like, I, I will look back and see things I've done because I think God was upset with me, so maybe I opened the Scripture, or maybe I prayed because I thought, well, you know, God's kind of upset with me. And it's never really a conscious thought that enters my mind. It's only in retrospect when I look back, it's like, what motivated you to do what you just did? And I think, well, it was because I thought God was mad at me, you know, or... It's really hard to describe. But, uh, but yeah, so Christ is the propitiation for our sins. Uh, and again, it satisfies a just God. Now, notice if you go back to chapter 2 of 1 John. Uh, let's see. 2. Go back to chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice how God is not only faithful to, to on a relational level, forgive our sins or to wash our feet as Jesus did or as the, the, high, the priests would, would go to the, the brazen laver and wash their hands and wash their feet before they would do any other service, they had to continually go back to the brazen labor and, and wash uh, 
the dirt that had collected on their skin ceremonially to do that. But he is also just, he is just to forgive us our sins. In other words, he's not turning a blind eye and saying, oh, you, you know, oh, you rascal, you just go on in there. Don't you do that again. It's not like that. God is just and holy, and he must judge sin. Well, now he's righteous to forgive sin because he's the propitiation that satisfied his wrath uh, was the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he is just in forgiving us. And then, of course, it infuriates Satan. Because Satan has absolutely no indicting power anymore. He is the great plaintiff that comes before God, and he accuses the brethren day and night, right? We learn that in Revelation chapter 12. Day and night he's accusing the brethren, and yet nothing sticks because Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. And it, there's no accusation that Satan can bring against us. And he doesn't, again, I always point this out, Satan doesn't have to fabricate accusation. He has plenty of accusation to bring against us before God. And that's one of the hardest things is knowing. Like you say, looking at the past, all the stuff you've done, and just uh, start digging a hole, and it's like, well, I'm already digging, and you know, I'm starting to feel worse, and starting to feel bad about the stuff. And so that's just him just feeding the fire within you without yeah. you even knowing it half the time. Absolutely. Then, Very soft. all of a sudden it's just like, oh man, like, I can never get out of this dark bedroom I'm living in. Yeah. Type things, you know, that's, yeah. I know, yeah. It's, uh, and then what, you get in depression, despair. Yeah. It all just uh, snowballs on itself. Yeah. And the next thing you know, it just results into extreme measures of self-medication or whatever you got to do to numb out the fog that's in your mind. Yeah. Make you think, you know, just justify everything. Like, oh, I'm going to justify doing this just because I feel bad, so I'm going to do, you know, but then, you know, that, like saying, like, but then you put Jesus in your life, it's like, it's all, it just once, it's all gone. I mean, you still think about it, but like, that's not, you're not thinking about the past, you're thinking about what's in front of you, like yeah. how, you know, you're waiting for the sun to come up, not waiting for it to go down. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I like that perspective. So, yeah, and Satan does that. I mean, I, I don't know how many times Satan will bring up things from the past. He'll subtly get my mind off of Christ, and then he'll introduce a, an indictment against me. And, uh, or, or even a, 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 you know, a, you know, a, a, a sinful pattern or, or behavior set, a personality uh, thing, that uh, a proclivity toward a certain sinful pattern, you know. Um, and he'll start to just gently point those things out, subtly point those things out, and then slowly bring condemnation into my heart. And I have to snap out of it and say, Christ is the propitiation for my sins, you know. Uh, otherwise, if you, if you don't rest in the finished work of Christ, you will, you will fall into despair. You will be discouraged in the Christian walk. And really, I think that is ground zero of the entire spiritual battle. To rest in Christ or to be pulled, enticed outside of Christ and to walk in your own righteousness. And, well, I'm doing this. I got this going on. That should, you know, I think we're good, you know, kind of measuring your life about what you're doing and stuff instead of just resting in Christ. We're accepted in the Beloved. That's great. We're accepted in the Beloved. That's it. Nothing can change that. Okay, uh, the next theological result reconciliation. That's how you pronounce it in the Greek. A little joke there. Uh, reconciliation. Uh, to change mutually. To win over to friendliness. To reconcile. Uh, by way of definition, it means to change the relationship of one person to another. To change from enmity or warfare to friendship. The position of the world was changed by the death of Christ, so that all men are now able to be saved. His death rendered the whole world savable, yet salvation is applied to those who believe. And there is a doctrine, it's a false doctrine, called the limited atonement. If you're familiar with the Calvinist uh, an acronym, or, uh, acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, L stands for limited atonement. And that doctrine is that Jesus shed his blood only for the elect. It's not for the whole world. Uh, Jesus only died for those who are going to believe. 
And his, his shed blood is not effective for those who are not going to believe. Uh, and if you look back at 1 John 2, 2, you see, and he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, uh, limited atonement is a, is a false doctrine. Now, the capacity for salvation is there for every man, but the appropriation is only to those that believe. So it's not a universalism that Jesus died and therefore everyone is going to be saved. It's only applied to those who receive it by faith. But think about it. If the atonement is limited, then it is a false offer to preach the gospel to someone who is not the elect because the blood of Jesus Christ was not shed for them. So therefore, you could not share the gospel with everyone because you would essentially be lying to them. It's like, you, he didn't really die for you. He didn't die for you. Um, but as it is, the, the, the appeal is legitimate. If you come, if you respond by faith, you will be saved, period. The banquet is set. You've been invited to the banquet. There is a place there for you. There's enough fruit, food for you. All you got to do is come and receive it and partake of the banquet. Whereas limited atonement would be, well, we've only set the we've only set ten places at the table, but we're inviting everybody. <laughs> but there's only ten that are going to get to eat. <laughs> so how would you know if you're one of the elect? They just judge you on your works, like how much, you know, how many cars you washed or something. Or? Well, you know what the, the sad thing in Calvinism is. Yes, what they do is they ultimately the ultimate test is, are you enduring to the end? That's the only test we've got. And tragically, because that's a P, T-U-L-I-P, perseverance of the saints. That a true Christian has true saving faith. The elect will persevere unto the end in good works. And so the problem is, with everyone who believes that doctrine, they go to their grave uncertain about their salvation. Because any time you measure yourself against your works, guess what? You've sinned. And you don't know, have I done enough? Well, no, you haven't done enough. You can't ever do enough. And it's a, it's a poison. It's a poison of this nonsense, perseverance of the saints. Uh, <clears throat> uh, by the way, that passage that they go to is Matthew chapter 24. Uh, I can't remember the exact verse. Somewhere around 13, 14, somewhere around there. Uh, he who shall endure to the end shall be saved is the passage that they go to. That passage is speaking of the Jewish people in the time of the tribulation. The Jews who endure to the end of the tribulation, they will be saved. The final one-third, the two-thirds of the Jewish population is going to be massacred by the Antichrist in the three-and-a-half-year period. But those Jews who endure to the end, and particularly those who flee to Basra, remember, let, they, let them that are in Judea flee to the mountains... Let him that's on the rooftop not come down and get his clothes and pray that this day that this uh, doesn't happen on the Sabbath day. Why would a believer in Jesus Christ, a Gentile believer in the church of Jesus Christ, first of all, be in Judea? Second of all, why would I care if it's on the Sabbath day? We're, we're not bound by the Mosaic Law. He's talking to the Jews. To the Jews who are alive at the time of the abomination of desolation. All those that endure to the end, they will be saved. They will have the Spirit of God poured upon them. They will recognize Jesus as their Messiah. They will cry, they have three days of mourning. Then the third day they'll cry out for Messiah to come and deliver them from Antichrist. And every one of them will be saved and they enter into the kingdom. And then from that point on into eternity, there will be no more Jew that is in unbelief. Every Jew born into the Messianic kingdom will be a believer in Messiah. Not true of the Gentiles. And so that's interesting too, is that when Satan is released from the abyss at the end of the thousand year period, and he's able to marshal multitudes of people, it's more than this, the sand of the seashore, the Bible says, and they will come up against the holy city and then fire comes down from heaven and consumes them. Everyone in that army that's coming to destroy or to overthrow Jesus Christ in the Messianic kingdom, they will all be Gentiles. And of course, they do come from the four corners of the earth. It's not from Israel that they're coming. They don't rise up in Israel in revolt. But anyway, those are just interesting facts. Whoa, where did we get off on this? We're talking about tulip, perseverance of the saints. 
<clears throat> now there is a truth in perseverance of the saints if it's if it's applied appropriately. We will endure because we're in Christ. <laughs> he's we're, he's holding us, you know. So that's why we're going to endure. But it doesn't mean that we're going to have a certain behavior set faithfully at the time of our death. And I've got several quotes from a lot of Calvinists, R.C. Sproul and other Calvinists, who clearly indicate that <laughs> they measure a man's salvation based on if he endures the end of good works. Uh, R.C. Sproul, uh, most notably, had a prayer. He was at a big conference of the death of a uh, prominent Christian. I can't think of the guy's name. But anyway, the guy was dying. He was on his deathbed that night, the night of the conference. Uh, Boyce was his last name. I can't remember his first name. But something James Boyce or John Boyce. Anyway, word got to R.C. Sproul as he was leading this conference. And he said, let's, let's all stop and pray that Dr. Boyce will endure in his faith. Endure, will persevere to the end. And I, I, I've heard a statement from him also that he was, that uh, R.C. Sproul was 99% sure he was going to go to heaven. It's that 1% of uncertainty. Well, that 1% of uncertainty will drive you nuts. <laughs> that's going to terrify you. <laughs> Who cares if it's a half of a percent, man? That, that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, so anyway, Reconciliation. Uh, his death rendered the whole world savable, yet salvation is applied to those who believe. So let's look at some passages. Romans 5.10. Flip over there. Romans 5.10. So I read that one. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Okay, beautiful. I think I preached heavily on this passage in the past here. Uh, so notice this. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. By what? By the death of His Son. See how this goes back to the propitiation? Christ is the propitiation for our sins. How am I reconciled to God? I need to know. Oh, it's by the death of His Son. It's not by anything you do. It's by the death of His Son. Okay? When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Remember that? When we were not saved? We're unbelievers. We're enemies of God. And even while we were enemies and sinners and ungodly, we were reconciled by the death of His Son that epiphany moment of faith we believe. Remember when in the past, okay, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God? Okay, now, much more now, being reconciled, see, we were enemies, and when we were enemies, God reconciled us, when we were enemies, when we just hated God, everything we did was contrary to the will of God, we were indulging ourselves in our own sinful lives and unbelief and we were the enemy of God, remember that? And God still reconciled us when we were enemies? Okay, much more now, now, after we believed, we shall be saved by His life. So think about it. If God reconciled us when we were the enemies, you think He's going to lose us now that we are reconciled? It doesn't make any sense. He says, much more now, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now that also speaks, we shall be saved. The future tense salvation. What is the future tense salvation that we have not experienced yet? Close. Rapture. Okay, what happens at the rapture, Daniel? The resurrection. When the salvation is complete, we get the glorified body. So right now, our spirit man is born again. We're a new creature in Christ, spiritually, the inner man. This old body is decaying. I got a doctor's appointment on Monday. Dental appointment <laughs> later. I got some. Hey, man, I'm 54 now. The gums are getting raw. Like, oh, I got to see the dentist about that, you know. Still so, gums. <laughs> getting a little long in the tooth, right? I didn't know what that meant until I got old. <laughs> My teeth growing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to do like <laughs> <laughs> Alright. So praise God. This is great. Um, 
If when we are enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled. That means we're right now, we're in a state of reconciliation. God is not angry with us. Oh, but I really screwed up today. I know you did. He's still not angry. We're reconciled. All of His anger was spent on Jesus Christ. Now He's satisfied. Christ is a propitiation for our sins, and now we're reconciled. We're cool. The devil doesn't want us to know that. He doesn't want us to abide in that reality. He wants us to, oh, God's mad, and I got, you know, and when you do that, you, you focus back on yourself. You put yourself back under a works righteousness uh, thought pattern, and then you're in a spiral of sin, uh, guilt, despair, confession, sin, guilt, you know, what was that? What did I say? It was sin, guilt, despair, confession, over and over and over again, never getting traction because you're not resting in the reality that is still unchanged, that Christ is a propitiation for our sins. And we're reconciled to God. Right now I'm reconciled to God. Satan will throw all these sins at me. You know, I, I've talked about, you know, constantly about, you know, that I get a little frustrated with my kids. A little, a little frustrated. I remember asking my friend years ago, I said, do you ever yell at your kids? We were ch the first time we had chat, we're in Iceland. Ooh, this is cool. I'm chatting with him live in the States. You ever yell at your kids, I'd done something, I'd yell at the kids, I'd done something, I was upset with them. And then I was feeling guilty about it. <laughs> he responded, does a mouse eat cheese? <laughs> so that made me feel a little bit better. But, um, but even, even if I, if I uh, get upset with the kids and get angry, uh, which, which does happen, um, I'm, I'm reconciled to God. That doesn't mean I shouldn't deal with that issue, that, that anger issue toward the kids, but I'm reconciled to God. I can't change. Uh, we shall be saved by His life. So, this again it goes back to uh, the sermon two weeks ago. What we have to realize is that these bodies are decaying. Um, these bodies, if the Lord tarries, are going for every believer. Remember, even we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan. Okay? These bodies are going to decay to the point that they're no longer suitable for our spirit to dwell in it. And our spirit will be released from this body. Doesn't mean God hates you. Doesn't mean God's angry with you. Doesn't mean that you're not reconciled to God. It simply means that this old body has decayed. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. Read Romans chapter 8. We groan, being burdened. These bodies are falling apart. And all the prayer meetings and all the anointings and all the uh, in Jesus' name prayers will not prevent ultimately the death of this body, the dying of this body. But it doesn't mean God has forsaken you. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It simply means God's word is true and you're going to depart this world. And I remember what I pointed out uh, two weeks ago. One of the common threads between everyone that Jesus healed physically is that they all died. Every single one of them died. So any physical healing we receive in this life, which we're grateful for, and we want to pray for these things, uh, it is, uh, it's a temporary, temporary extension. Uh, ultimately, death will come for us if the rapture uh, is delayed. Okay, so the resurrection is huge. We want to look forward to that resurrection. Uh, Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Flip over to that. <clears throat> is Colossians the prayer of the people or a place? Colossae is the city. The Colossian. Oh, I'm sorry, no... Uh, it's a, keep going from Romans, go to the to the right. I mean, like, so the Colossians, so that's a people? No, it's the people of the city of Colossae, which most of these cities are in Asia Minor or modern-day modern Turkey. Yeah. Thessal, the Thessalonians, which uh, this, this might draw Russ back in here. He went, he's been in two... Thessaloniki. He's been there. He's seen mosaic tile in an ancient church talking about the Apostle Paul. A church that was built about, he might correct me here if, if I'm wrong, 
about 300 A.D., this church has got this beautiful mosaic talking about the Apostle Paul being in Thessaloniki. Wow. Yeah. Colossians 1, 20 and 21. That's why. Okay, go ahead. That's correct. Oh, yeah. Praise God. Read this. 20 and 21. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his own blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he was reconciled. Okay. Perfect. So notice verse 20. Having made peace, remember we're at war with God. We're the enemies of God. We actually are the children, the spiritual offspring of Satan through the fall of Adam. That's why we have to be born again to become a son or daughter of God. Having made peace, so we're at war, now God's made peace through what? Through the blood of His cross. Again, we look away from ourselves and we look to the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. That was the ransom price. Remember we talked about the ransom or the redemptive price? That Jesus Christ's body had to be broken and that blood, that, that blood had to be poured out and brought before God as a ransom price, appeasing the wrath of God against our sins. So now we see... Uh, he made peace, God has made peace through what? Through the blood of His cross. By Him, by Christ, to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. In heaven. And you, Colossian believers, that were sometime alienated, that means you're separated, you're an alien, you're separated from God, you're alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Remember, it says, notice the time stamp here. You were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind. Yet now, present tense, hath he reconciled. So notice God is doing all the work here. God is reconciling us to himself. It's not a joint partnership. God is doing everything necessary to reconcile the, the hostile rebels of humanity unto himself. And all our responsibility is, is to receive by faith everything he's done for us in Christ. You say, Amen. That's it, man. It's in Christ. Amen to this passage. We've got peace with God through the blood of his cross, not through my improved behavior. Through the blood of his cross. And you know, I can, I can say these things too and not worry too much about. Uh, well, let me back up. Dr. Erwin Lutzer, I remember this story. He said, there was a, a person in this church uh, <coughs> who was uh, who came to the church, and somehow he knew about his background. And uh, this person got saved in the, in his church, and he sat down with this gentleman, and he had a, a whole a whole lot of sexual baggage, a lot of evil sexual activity that was had been going on in his life, and uh, he uh, he came in and chatted with him about his salvation. And uh, he, uh, he was concerned after he left, you know, that he didn't really put enough emphasis on, you really, you know, you need to now, you need to kind of clean up that activity. God's not pleased with that activity. You need to kind of, it's great you believe in Jesus and you're saved, but you need to kind of clean up that activity and so forth. He didn't do that. He didn't, you know, admonish him. He thought the way he should. Well, anyway, six months later or, or some period of time that had elapsed, and, and the guy's life was transformed. And uh, it was all because of the gospel. It was all because of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. See, remember, the Holy Spirit resides with inside of us. And so the Spirit of God will guide us and empower us. And some people, uh, you know, for me, uh, my, my mouth cleared up real quickly. My profanity, profane 
speech was perpetual. It was a streaming evil out of my mouth. And God just, boom, capped that well of sewage. Put the cap on it real quick. I didn't have to say, well, I need to rein in my cursing. No, he put the cap on it. Now, I've had other sins that have continued to age 54. And I, I, I wish I could say I don't use profanity ever. Uh, there's, since I've got adult children, I've noticed a, kind of a spike. Uh, like I said, I'm a great Christian when I'm by myself. I really am. I'm at, I'm at peace and calm. But anyway, uh, so... So I, 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 you can rest in the grace of God and know that God, God's taking care of His people. He takes care of His own. So, uh, praise God. So we have peace with God through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ, not through our improved behavior and uh, faithfulness and ministry and so forth. Uh, and He's reconciled us. Uh, we were one time aliens and enemies in our mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We're reconciled to God through the blood of his cross. All right, 2 Corinthians 5.19. Flip over there. This one we actually kind of go backwards, back to the right. 2 Corinthians 5.19. So I'm going to read that. You know, let's go to 19 through 21. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the, their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. For ye be reconciled to God. For be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God in him. Okay. He might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Alright. So notice this. God, here again, God is doing all the work to bring about reconciliation. It wasn't a series of conferences and negotiation between God and man to come to terms of peace. No, God is doing it all. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So again, why not? Well, because uh, Christ is the propitiation for our sins. So to impute means to count or to reckon or to take inventory. So when you see this imputing their trespasses unto them, it means God took inventory of their deeds. Oh, trespass, scroll. Another trespass, another sin, more iniquity, sin, wickedness. It's not going to be counted in the inventory. It's not going to be attributed to you. Oh yeah, they're there. But he's reconciled through Jesus Christ. So they don't count. They don't count against you doesn't matter how evil it is. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Will not count against you. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And has committed unto us, right here, the word of reconciliation. This is where evangelism comes into play. The gospel of Jesus Christ. God has entrusted to every one of us the message of reconciliation. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, He was buried, and He rose again the third day. That is the message of reconciliation that God has entrusted to each one of us. And our responsibility, and I believe one of the fundamental things that we will be uh, uh, tested for at the Bema Seat Judgment, or rewarded for, let me say that, is did we take the message of reconciliation and share it with the lost? This is our primary responsibility. And the tragedy is today that so many people think that they're doing this, they're, they're speaking the word of reconciliation, but the devil has subtly substituted that word with church attendance. Oh, I invite people to church as often as I can. Now that's good, I, I want to encourage that. Mm -hmm. But that is not the word of reconciliation. Now hopefully they'll come to church and they'll hear the word of reconciliation, but going to church itself, hey, would you like to come to church with me on Tuesday? 
We got a special Tuesday service. I know people are busy, but can you come on there? That's great, man. Let them come. But that's not the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation is that God became a man in Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and He was raised from the dead the third day. And if you'll believe that, you'll have eternal life. You'll be reconciled to God. That is the primary work of the church of Jesus Christ. And that's the first time I've heard about it. We'll get to work. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I mean, like, my past church experience, I mean, they did, you know, this is like, why don't they all teach this? <laughs> what was that last day? Well, why don't they all teach this? They just, Amen. Why don't they? You know, this is like all my years of going to church, somewhere yeah. else. And this is the first time I've actually. I know. I know. And look how many people heard it tonight. One, two, three, four, five, six people. I'll get people's attention. So. That's what football's in. Now, I tried to make it really easy for us, and we've got good news cards. So all you got to do is say, hey, man, this is from our church. It's the good news of the gospel. It's just Bible verses. That's what I tell them. Say, see, I have this one, you know. Icebreaker. Hey, I'm a pastor, so it's not as weird. <laughs> and I like to give these cards out to people. It's a good news card. All it is is Bible verses, I tell them. It's not any crazy stuff, you know. It's just Bible verses, and I give it to them. And so now the seed, if they'll read that card, the seed's planted in their life. That's the word of reconciliation. That's it. But we've been entrusted with that word of reconciliation. Now notice it says, uh, continuing in this passage, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now what's an ambassador? Representative. Of what? A country. A foreign or, country. Or, or a kingdom, yes. That's right. So an ambassador is living, technically he's not living on foreign soil because technically the embassy is the soil of the country that's sending the person. But an ambassador represents a foreign country and a foreign king to the head of state of the country that they're at. So we are ambassadors for the kingdom of God on earth. That's why we're still here. We're serving as ambassadors to a hostile world. So imagine, uh, hey, I heard you got nominated for ambassadorship to North Korea. <laughs> That's who we are. We've been sent to North Korea. People don't want to hear this message. They don't want to hear about God. They're God-haters. But we this is why we're still here, as ambassadors for Christ. Christ, our King, has sent us as ambassadors. But you know what? My understanding is we're going to be diplomatically recalled really soon. And this mission is going to be over. The rapture of the church is imminent. We're going to be out of here soon. So, uh... We will be gone. Our work will be done at that point as ambassadors for Christ. But that's what we are. We're ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. He beseeches the world by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. We're appealing to you on behalf of Jesus Christ. And in this way, it can be stated in some sense that we are vicars of Christ or the representatives of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And we have a message from Jesus Christ to humanity. We're here in Christ's stead or in His place. Be ye reconciled to God. We're appealing to you. Please get reconciled to God. And when I preach the rescue mission, I always just preach the gospel message. And I emphatically tell people, you do not have to come to my church to be saved. You don't have to put a buck in the plate to be saved. You don't ever have to see me again to be saved. All you've got to do is receive the gospel that Christ died for your sins on the cross. He was buried and raised again. Just believe it. Receive it by faith and you'll be saved. Whether or not you see me again or come to my church. The church that I pastor. For He, God, has made Him, Christ, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin. Christ knew no sin personally. But God the Father has made Him to be sin for us. Why? That we, the sinner, might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You see, you know what the standard of righteousness is to get to heaven? You've got to have the same righteousness of God Himself. So guess what? That means you can never, ever, ever sin. Never. 
even a little inkling of sin. And once you've done that, you fall short. You are now a sinner. You cannot attain to the righteousness of God. Once you fail one time, then you cannot uh, make it on your own merit and righteousness. Now, we're born sinners, so that's a big problem for us because we come out of the womb in sin. We're woven together with the fabric of sin. It's impossible for us not to sin. So then how do I attain the righteousness of God? Well, you believe the gospel. And then God takes you spiritually and baptizes you spiritually into Jesus Christ. And therefore, His righteousness is now my righteousness. I'm in Him. It's like saying, how, how do you... Uh, how, how, Noah, Noah, how am I supposed to survive this flood you keep preaching about? Should I learn the backstroke? No, you still going to drown. No, but I've been working out, man. I've been, I'm strong. No, you're going to drown. <laughs> you got you to gotta do the backstroke for not only the 40 days and 40 nights that the entire earth is like a snow globe being shaken by God filled with water of His wrath, but also that water then is going to subside. And I forget how many, it was 100 and something days total that Noah was in the ark. Uh, you you got to do the backstroke day and night for over a hundred something days. It ain't happening. You can't do it. Uh, you just get in the ark. That's how that's how you be saved. You get in the ark. So you want to avoid the wrath of God. You want the righteousness of God. You got to get in the ark of Jesus Christ by faith. You're immersed into Him. You're baptized into Jesus Christ. You, then His righteousness is yours. Well, for how long? Oh, forever. That's why we have eternal life because His life is now our life. It's not our life. It's His life now in us. Uh, Galatians 2.20 For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. See, our life is no longer ours. It's Christ's life living in us. And we can never be separated out from the body of Christ anymore. Ever. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Stamped by the Spirit of God Himself. We have eternal life. Okay, let's go ahead and close any questions, comments. Thank God for Jesus, because like you're done. Uh, uh, just one. So me is kind of coming out as an outsider. Uh -huh. um, a little bit more than a visitor now. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but still now, you know, just coming in, just not really knowing. But it's just like, man, what a huge feat! Just what, like, because our daily struggles here, but then like thinking about Jesus and what He went through, like, yeah, it's just tremendous. Just, uh, I know I've struggled. Everybody else has struggled, but sure. just, just knowing that He did all that for us, and just how much pain and how much. Heartache, and did I can only imagine like some of our bad days, you know, like we don't want to get up the next morning, but his bad days are thousands of years of our bad days, yeah. So that's just it's amazing, just what the strength he had and his ability to do it. Just his him knowing that the Heavenly Father is going to make everything okay, just his faith in the yeah. Like that's, that's you. Well, yeah, when he's at the point, remember, he cried out, My God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? Which at that point it was at the end of the uh, uh, of his time on the cross, he become the sin offering. Now God the Father had separated out from His Son and was punishing Him. And now remember, remember He would always refer to God as His Father. But in this one instance, He did not refer to Him as fa His Father. He called Him My God, My God, because at that point there had been a a schism between Holy Father and the sin offering of Jesus. God is holy and He could no longer abide in communion with, with the Son. So now there's separation. He says, why have you forsaken me? It was because my sin and your sin at that moment was on Him. Think about that. My sin was on Him. And that's why the Father, why have you forsaken me? Well, because you know that Ron Tabor? Yeah. All his sin was put on you. So all of our sin broke the communication just for that long, just let him, so he could actually, so Jesus could actually feel the pain, like Jesus actually had, to him to complete, yeah, he had to, 
the wrath being poured upon him. No longer a communion. In fact, in that period, in that moment, he became the enemy. The sinner. Yeah. So, so that. So during that time, so did Satan? Cause to, during that time, did Satan have any power over Jesus? Like, hey, just keep coming this way, or like, because he's getting battered all the sin and started to feel all this. Did Satan have any power, any more power at that time, over anything? No, the only thing Satan was doing was tempting Jesus to come off the cross. That was the only thing he was doing. He had no power over Jesus. And even, you know, Jesus passed the test in the wilderness. Back, If you go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, you see Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by Satan. So where Adam was tempted and failed, Jesus, the second Adam, he was tempted and passed so that he is a worthy Savior. Where Adam failed, Jesus was victorious. So Satan never had power over Jesus. All he could do was try and entice or tempt Jesus to deviate from the will of the Father. So at the very end, Satan is enticing Jesus to come off the cross by sending his messengers to say, Ha, ha, ha! Oh, if you're the Son of God, come down off the cross. The people mocking him were a satanic temptation for Jesus to come off the cross. Because if Jesus came off the cross, then there's no redemption and Satan's power is still secure over mankind. Satan now is a toothless tiger. The only thing Satan can do is bluff humanity. Because if humanity ever discovers that Jesus Christ has set him free, he's doomed. He has no power against that. So he bluffs and intimidates our feelings and our sin nature, agree with Satan. Oh yeah, there's, there's no hope for me, man. I'm too far gone. So he's a liar. He's a deceiver. He, 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 his greatest power is in that deception. That's a, really, that's his only power is deception. He no longer has power. Christ had crushed his head on the cross. His head was crushed. He's, he's, he's a snake that just had his body is still wiggling. But his head is ground into the pulp to the earth. So, <clears throat> so Jesus, yeah, was tempted, but then Satan had no power. Alright, let's close the prayer. Lord, we're grateful for our time, study, and uh, the reconciliation, God, that you have provided for in Jesus Christ. We're so thankful, Father, that Christ is the propitiation for our sins. So we're free. We're reconciled. Much more now being reconciled to God we shall be saved through His life. We shall be saved through His life, or by His life. So, we look forward to the resurrection, Lord. The, we've been sealed unto the day of redemption by the Spirit of God. We thank You for that promise, that blessed hope of the appearing, the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ to come for the church or to change us. And Lord, we can't even imagine what it's like to not have a sinful urge, a sinful desire, a sinful act because it's so much, it permeates so much of our every single day of living. So we thank you for that hope. Uh, may you fortify our, our faith as we go forward and return us again safely on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.